All right, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to episode 66. This is the final episode in this series on the Kingdom Fungi. This has been a wild ride, as the fungi are an exotic and ephemeral lineage. They're essential to the Earth's ecosystems, and yet they're like nothing else. Although many fungi are parasitic, many more are symbiotic with other organisms. And these fungal symbioses with plants and insects and animals are so powerful that they've had a profound influence on the evolution of earthly life. As humans evolved, we eventually descended from the shrinking East African forests, and we walked upright across the Horn of Africa, across the East African Rift Valley, and across the plains of the Sahel and the sandy expanses of the Maghreb. Humans then spread out of Africa, into Asia, into Europe, and then Australia, and across the islands of the Pacific Ocean and the Bering Land Bridge, into the New World. As we spread out and colonized our planet, we explored it, and we learned from it, and we learned about the other forms of life that live here with us. We learned that animals could provide food, and hide, and bones. And we learned that plants can provide wood, and food, and medicines, and poisons. And we also learned that fungi have a wide variety of uses as well. And the fungi found a very important place, and a very important purpose, in human societies. This is the subject that I'll be exploring today. How humans have interacted with and used fungi throughout our history, from the ancient and the prehistoric past into the modern day. In a very general sense, humans use fungi in many of the same ways that we use plants. Various species of edible fungus are farmed as food, and those with medicinal qualities are used or consumed for their beneficial effects. In more modern times, our access to advanced technology has allowed us to study fungi on a chemical level, looking at their cells and their genes and their proteins. We can isolate fungal compounds and purify them to make chemicals that serve some practical purpose in the 21st century. I'll explore all of this and more in much greater detail in today's episode. In the earliest days of our existence, there was no recorded knowledge, and all that was known was transmitted through the generations orally, or through physical demonstration. There were no books, there were no written languages. We were, in a very literal sense, naked and afraid, while wandering in the vastness of the world. To learn something required a touch of bravery. Imagine an ancient human living in the forest. They find a mushroom that they've never seen before. It's a new discovery. The shaman or the chieftain or some elders from the tribe all come to examine it, and they wonder at its qualities, at its traits. Is it edible? Is it poisonous? Does it have some other effect or some use? These questions had no answers until someone dared to eat it. Ancient peoples would typically first try feeding the mushrooms to an animal in a primitive kind of animal test study. The animal's response, from happily eating the mushroom to shuddering in pain and dying from a poison, this gave a lot of clues as to the nature of the fungus. But this technique isn't foolproof. Some compounds may react differently in animals as they do in humans. Other compounds are only dangerous or fatal if you eat a lot of them. Some compounds have delayed actions or psychotropic actions that aren't immediately apparent to a third party, you know, to an outside observer. Now, many humans were also used to experiment as kind of like guinea pigs, maybe willingly or unwillingly. And many of these people suffered and died to teach their communities about the dangers of various species of fungus. In the cases where the mushroom was discovered to be edible, this would have been excellent news. It was a new food resource, and it was added variety to the diet. However, in cases where the new discovery wasn't edible, or it was dangerous, the daring person might become ill, perhaps terribly ill, to the point that they might even die. There are quite a number of poisonous fungi out there, some of which cause mild problems like a digestive discomfort, and some of them are extremely fatal. For example, the fungal genus Claviceps 
has ergot fungi, like the species Claviceps purpurea, which infect and grow on rye plants and cousins of rye plants. Now humans and other animals can accidentally ingest ergot while eating the rye, or by eating bread that's made from rye, and this can lead to ergot poisoning. This is characterized by disruptions in neurotransmission, which can cause hallucinations, convulsions, and seizures, nausea, and vomiting, and in high enough doses, it can be fatal. The Galeria genus includes species of fungi that form small mushroom fruiting bodies, with little rusty brown caps. The species Galerina sulciceps is found in Indonesia and southern India, and it's particularly deadly. It produces alpha, beta, and gamma aminotins, which are all deadly to humans in certain doses. Alpha aminotin is the deadliest, as it's known to inhibit the activity of the RNA polymerase 2 and 3 enzymes. These enzymes play a critical role in cell function, so their inhibition by this poison pretty much means cell death, and then organism death. Symptoms of alpha amanitin poisoning last several days, and they start with diarrhea and abdominal cramps. The kidneys and the liver experience a total collapse, and death occurs shortly thereafter, which is typically about six to seven days after exposure or after infection. The species Galerina marginata is similarly poisonous, as it contains many of the same amatoxins. The Lepiota genus is composed of various species of gilled mushrooms that are typically small and white, with little scales on their caps. Now, none of these Lepiota mushrooms are edible thanks to the presence of amatoxins. Species in this genus, like L. castanea and L. subincarnata, have all been known to kill people. The Conocybe genus also has a lethal amatoxin-containing species among its ranks, called the Conocybe filaris. Several more of these Conocybe species are also poisonous, but not lethally so. They have enough toxin to alter your consciousness after ingestion, and this can be uncomfortable, you know, can induce psychoactive effects that may or may not be desired, but I'll get into these kinds of fungi later on. These amatoxins are also found in a species called the death cap, or the Amanita phylloides, which is an extremely lethal fungus. Its fruiting body is a pale white mushroom, with patches of pale greenish, tan hues dotting the cup and the stem. Supposedly, a single mushroom possesses enough poison to kill two fully grown humans. Because of its widespread distribution, which extends across pretty much all of Europe into Russia, the Middle East, and North Africa, there have been thousands of societies that have had access to A. phylloides mushrooms and their poison. For these reasons, this mushroom is believed to be involved in the majority of intentional poisonings, including those of noble or royal blood. For example, the Roman emperor Claudius is believed to have been killed uh, due wholly or in part to amatoxin poisoning from the Amanita phylloides. The historical figure Charles VI, who lived during the 17th and 18th centuries, he was also an emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, and his symptoms immediately before his death were consistent with amatoxin poisoning. The Amanita genus includes species responsible for most cases of fungal poisonings in humans. Besides the Amanita phylloides, there's the Amanita virosa, Amanita exidialis, and Amanita ocreata, which are all white mushrooms in a group called the Destroying Angels. They're called the Destroying Angels because they're all very dangerous. Many of them are very deadly. But besides these poisonous species, the Amanita genus also contains numerous mushrooms that are not just edible and safe to eat, but they're also delicious and nutritious. This includes the white and yellow gold Amanita calyptrata, and the Caesar's mushroom, or Amanita caesarea. Caesar's mushroom is eaten widely across Europe, where it's relatively popular. Uh, Caesar's mushroom is especially popular in Italy. You know, it's named after Caesar. They even have a festival just for this mushroom. There's all kinds of edible mushrooms out there in the world, and a lot of them are very popular. They exist in the diets of pretty much all people, including people who live very archaic lifestyles, and people who live ultra-modern lifestyles. Mushrooms are ubiquitous in the human diet. In 1991, 
there was a corpse that was recovered in the Oetzel Alps in Europe, and this corpse was more than 3,000 years old. It was named Oetzee the Iceman. His body was like a walking time capsule of what life was like for people back then. His chalcolithic corpse had on it clothes woven out of grass, a loincloth and a coat that was made from sheepskin, and a belt that had a little pouch attached. Contained in this little pouch, and in pockets and bags elsewhere on his person, he had several items like a copper axe, some birch bark baskets, and some berries for food. Otzi had died with food in his belly, food from a meal eaten within the day of his death. In his stomach and intestines were partially digested wheat, fruits, and vegetables, as well as some ibex meat, red deer meat, and some fatty goat meat, suggesting that his last meals were pretty hearty and protein-rich. In the local area of his corpse, perhaps scattered from his bags and pockets after he died in the mountains, were found a bunch of flax seeds, grains of barley, and various small fruits like figs and berries. Otzi also had an intestinal parasite called whipworm, or Trichurus trichuria. He had 61 black tattoos all over his body, with ink made from fireplace ash. He had femurs and a pelvis that were shaped for walking over rugged, mountainous terrain. He had cavities in his teeth, and he was lactose intolerant, suggesting that the evolved lactose tolerance in milk-drinking societies either hadn't come around yet, or he was one of the relic gene lines that simply didn't have the necessary alleles. Otzi was determined to be of a southern European genetic lineage, closely related to the Sardinians and the Corsicans. Various studies conducted in the mid-2010s have found that his genes imply a higher-than-normal amount of Neanderthals in his family tree. They also imply that he had Lyme disease, that he was at risk for arthrosclerosis, or plaque buildup in his arteries. And there was even a study that linked Otzi to currently living people. That study in particular, from 2013, identified 19 men of Western Austrian descent who share a unique mutation with Otzi. Otzi the Iceman also carried two types of mushrooms. One of these mushrooms is called a tinder fungus, and the other is called a birch fungus. The birch fungus is known to possess a chemical that wards off helminths, or parasitic worms. Now, keeping parasitic worms away would have been a, a critically helpful thing to have in the ancient world. And Otzi the Iceman carried this birch fungus as a kind of antibiotic analog for parasitic worms. The tinder fungus, or the species Fomus fomentarius, has a similarly cool function. Now, it's inedible, so it provides no nutritional value, but it does have an internal tissue called an amadou. This amadou tissue is spongy, and it can sustain a slow-burning fire. The amadou tissue can also be cut into strips and used as tinder for a fire. Furthermore, the amadou can be lit on fire while it's still inside of the mushroom. In these cases, the fire will burn slowly, and the mushroom can be tucked away and carried. The fire will keep slowly burning within it, and then the mushroom can be brought out, opened up, and the embers can be used to start a new fire. And in this way, it works kind of like a Neolithic lighter for starting fires. It's like having a little torch with you everywhere you go that you don't have to carry, or you don't have to worry about it burning anything else that you have, because it's all just wrapped up in slow burning inside. Okay, I'm kind of getting off topic, so let me refocus back on fungus as food. Mushrooms of all kinds have been a staple in people's diet for millennia. Mushrooms are popular in Africa, in Europe, in the Americas, and especially in China. Generic mushroom foods include mushroom cream soups, which are just warm soups with mushrooms. There's mushroom gravies, sauces, and mushroom ketchups that are condiments that can be put on other entrees. Mushroom sauce on perfectly baked chicken or filet mignon can make for a really good dinner, and it looks really good on a plate, too. So this is the kind of mature, refined dish that you would make for a date that you were trying to impress with your cooking skills or something. Mushrooms can also be sautéed in butter or in oil, or they can be stuffed with vegetables, they can be stuffed with meats like sausage, and other various kinds of fillings and flavorings and stuff. 
Perhaps the most common and well-known use of fungus in food is the use of yeast to make bread, or baker's yeast, which is mainly a species called Saccharomyces cerevisiae. This baker's yeast used to make bread is the same species, but a slightly different genetic strain as the yeast that's used to produce alcohol for beer and liquor and whatnot. These fungal microbes metabolize the fermentable sugars in the dough, and they turn them into carbon dioxide and ethanol. The carbon dioxide forms bubbles, and you see these when you tear open a piece of bread, and you can, you can look at it and see all of the little bubble structures that are formed in the material. These are all bubbles that form from the yeast's metabolic activity. In Eastern Europe, from the Balkans all the way down to Turkey, they make a dish called siulama. This is a mixture of some kind of meat with mushrooms, slathered in a white sauce made from flour and grease-fried onions. Another Balkan mushroom dish is called selsko meso, which is a stir-fry-like mixture of pork, beef, tomatoes, onions, cream cheese, peppers, and mushrooms, in addition to spices, salts, and wine. These are typically all mixed together and cooked into a delicious medley. In Haiti, there's a meal called diriak jonjon, which is a mixture of rice and black mushrooms called jonjon, served with meat. The mushrooms are boiled, which stains the water a grayish-black color, and this then soaks into the rice, and this is what gives the dish and the rice its signature flavor. Now there's a French recipe, and it has a name that I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce right. Duxé? It's pronounced phonetically as duxelles, but that's clumsy, and the French language is much more elegant than that, so I think it's pronounced duxé. Uh, but, oh well, whatever. Uh, this duxé is a paste, or a stuffing. It's produced when you take a white or a brown mushroom, and you dry it out and mince it, or cut it up into a bunch of tiny little pieces. You can use porcini mushrooms if you want a stronger kick to it. Anyway, these tiny mushroom pieces are mixed with onions or shallots and various herbs and peppers, and then it's all sautéed in butter and mixed until it's a thick fluid, like a paste or a cream. It can be used as a sauce or another entree, or it can be used as a filling for a pastry. Another French recipe comes from a French cook who was in the employ of a Russian prince, and he created a dish that he called veal orlof, which is thinly sliced veal filled with mushrooms and duxé sauce and onions between the slices. This is cooked into a pie shape, or a flat pizza-like shape, and it's covered with momé sauce. In Russia, this style of cooking and preparing veal is called uh, French meat, or French-style meat. The oyster mushroom is a large, edible mushroom with a thin cap, which makes it popular in the culinary arts. Because the mushroom cap is thin, it can be easily torn up into little strips for sautés and stir-fries. If the cap is cooked whole or in pieces, its flat shape allows it to be cooked relatively quickly and evenly, so it's, it's convenient. The caps can be eaten by themselves, or they can be used in part of another dish, like an edible spoon filled with vegetables, or a sauce, or a rice and wheat mixture. The oyster mushrooms are popular in vegetarian cuisine because they're a solid, nutritious, non-animal food that can be combined with numerous other foods to make a wide variety of dishes. Shiitake mushrooms are also a popular food, especially in Japan and elsewhere in East Asia. In the episode on humans and plants in my series on the Kingdom Plantea, I talked about the dish that's popular in China called Buddha's Delight. Now, Buddha's Delight is a flexible dish, it has a large number of possible ingredients that can all be mixed and matched together to meet your particular tastes. And a common ingredient in Buddha's Delight, especially in the purely vegetarian forms of it, are mixed or sautéed mushrooms, like the shiitake mushroom. In Japan, shiitake mushrooms are a possible ingredient that are used to make miso soup. Miso soup is a soup that's made from miso paste, which is produced with fermenting soybeans, salt, and the kojikin fungus or the Aspergillus orizaea. There's another mushroom in East Asia called the Anokotaki, or the winter fungus, or seafood mushrooms, or velvet foot, among several other names. This Anokotaki mushroom is used in salads, or it can be eaten by itself. And besides being pretty tasty and nutritious, it offers a few beneficial compounds, like antioxidants, and a protein that's involved in immune system regulation. 
The Japanese also eat mushrooms that they call shimeji, which exist across East Asia and Northern Europe. The shimeji mushrooms are known for their strong, protein-rich flavor when cooked. If eaten raw, it can be unpleasantly bitter, but when cooked properly, the bitterness melts away, and the mushroom becomes an excellent filler item, which can be mixed in with other ingredients. The cooked shimeji mushroom is tasty, somewhat crunchy, and ideal for stir-fry and rice mixes. It's eaten with meat, it's used in soups and sauces, and it's part of a stir-fry rice dish called takikomi gohan. In China, there's a popular mushroom called a snow fungus, or the silver ear fungus, or by its scientific name, Tremella fusiformis, and it produces gelatinous white fruiting bodies that are affectionately called white jelly mushrooms. Oddly, the mushroom has no real flavor, despite being used in a variety of dishes. The desired quality is its texture, which is soft and semi-fluid, you know, it's gelatinous. It's mixed with jujubes and other ingredients to make luk mei, which is a sweet-tasting dessert soup. It's used for the same purpose in other sweet-tasting foods, like ice creams, flavored drinks, and in Vietnamese desserts like puddings and soups. There's a genus of fungi called tubers, which includes among its member species a large number of delicious edible truffles. Truffles are fungi with hypogeous fruiting bodies. That is to say, the fruiting body grows underground, in the soil, and this makes them kind of hard to find. Humans have long used animals like pigs and dogs to detect these truffles, which can then be dug up and gathered so that they can be cooked and eaten. Some examples of these include the Oregon white truffle, or the pecan truffle, which has recently been selling for more than $160 a pound, or the burgundy truffle, which is really popular in France and Italy. Now, I could go on about edible mushrooms, because the list is almost endless. I mean, there is a lot of edible mushrooms, and there's a lot of countries and cultures that consume mushrooms as a regular or a staple part of their diet in a huge variety of dishes, so I could go on forever, basically. But for the sake of brevity, I'll move on from fungal foods to other constructive ways that humans have used fungus. In all of the episodes of this series, I've talked about how good fungi are at exuding chemicals. They're these crazy, exotic, chemical-generating machines, and we can study all of these chemicals and find specialized uses for them. Many fungal chemicals and byproducts have a medicinal effect, and they're used in both folk medicine and modern medicine. The folk medicinal use of fungus has a long history. For example, Chinese folk medicine has been using fungi like the Lingzi mushroom for over 2,000 years. In the Chinese historical record, Book of Han, the Lingzi mushroom is referred to as the mushroom of immortality. And in Vietnam, the Lingzi mushroom is called the soul mushroom, or the spirit mushroom due perhaps in part to their role in medicine, in, in treatment, in healthcare, although it hasn't been shown to have any significant effect on humans based on modern medical science, with modern technology. And this is kind of a recurring problem with a lot of folk medicine. If it works, or if it has a compound that's genuinely useful, then it generally gets adopted into the sphere of legit medicine. But if it has no purpose beyond a placebo effect of, you know, whatever the seller says it does, then it typically stays in the sphere of folk medicine, and it has a dubious effect, at best. Some of this folk medicine isn't even described as having a physical effect, like consuming the caterpillar fungus, or the Ophiocordyceps sinensis. This caterpillar fungus is described in Chinese folk medicine as being useful in restoring or balancing your yin and yang. The fungus parasitizes caterpillars and moths from the genus Thyterides, which has been described in the Chinese historical records as an ideal balance of yin and yang, as it has both animal and vegetable forms, as they say. This is the case where folk wisdom is not particularly wise, because this isn't yin and yang. This is a parasite painfully hollowing out and infesting the living body of a host animal, and eating them doesn't rebalance your chi it puts you at risk of arsenic poisoning. Although, 
it definitely should be understood that this doesn't mean that all folk medicine is useless. It doesn't mean that all folk medicine is an archaic placebo. A lot of stuff that's been around for a long time actually works. You know, there's a reason some of this stuff has stuck around. And some of these treatments, they might use chemicals that are legitimately medicinal, even though the people using them might not know how or why they work, or how best to apply them or use them. Modern medicine and technologically modern science has revealed a huge diversity of fungal compounds with many uh, medicinal qualities. Many of these compounds are found directly in the fungus, and these were often the most readily available fungus-based medicines for people in the past who didn't have access to these advanced technologies. For example, there's a polypore mushroom called Griffola frondosa, which is native to Japan, China, and North America. In Japan, it's really popular, and it's been used medicinally for centuries. Consumption in humans has been shown to be of minor benefit to the immune system, by acting as a kind of cell stimulator, and it has a compound that can potentially be used to treat tumors by causing cancer cells to undergo apoptosis. Another fungus with immune-stimulating properties is the Agaricus subrufescens, which has a lot of beta-glucans that stimulate the activity and the effectiveness of the immune system. Another fungus with anti-tumor properties is the Ganoderma aplanatum, which is also called bear's bread, because the fruiting body looks like a big, thick pancake growing out of the side of a tree. There are a few more species that produce chemicals that can potentially treat cancer, or cancer symptoms. But the organization Cancer Research UK says that no mushroom or mushroom extract has been shown to prevent or cure cancer. This doesn't mean that treatment is out of the question. For example, cancer of the bone marrow, or leukemia, can be treated with a medicine called asparaginase. Now, asparaginase comes from the E. coli bacteria, but it can also come from the fungi in the genus Penicillium. Some fungus, like Penicillium reastrichii, are used in the process of synthesizing medications that disrupt cell division to slow down the growth of tumors. P. reastrichii is specifically used in the production of a chemotherapy drug called paclitaxel, or taxol. Now, there's no way that I can talk about the medicinal uses of fungus, and about the penicillium genus in particular, without mentioning penicillins. The penicillins are an extremely valuable and potent group of antibiotics, which were first discovered by Alexander Fleming in 1928. The penicillins are bacteria-destroying chemicals produced by fungus from the genus Penicillium. Now, there are various types of penicillin, but they all generally work by really thoroughly chemically degrading a bacteria's cell wall. Because bacteria have a really high internal pressure, this degradation of their cell wall causes them to lose pressure, and they basically explode. The story of penicillin's discovery is famous. Alexander Fleming noticed that a petri dish with staphylococcus bacteria was mistakenly left open, and there was now a teal-colored mold growing on it. Around the mold, there was an area of inhibited bacterial growth, which made Fleming think that maybe the mold had some kind of antibiotic qualities. Working in relative obscurity due to his difficulty communicating and publicly speaking about his research, Fleming found that penicillin was non-toxic to humans, and that it could be stabilized with the treatment of heat and the proper pH. Penicillin was then used to treat bacterial infections in mice and other animals, you know, in the early tests, before it was used in human infants and human adults. And it was even used as a preventative measure to stop bacterial infections in the damaged tissue of burn victims. It was produced en masse for the troops during World War II, and after the war, it became commonly used among the public. This wasn't a minor feat, either, as mass-producing penicillin was, for quite some time, really challenging and very expensive. But in the modern day, penicillins have been used to create derivative medicines with a much broader range of effect, as in they can affect a wider range of bacterial species with various chemical defenses. Some of these derived medicines include methicillin, flucloxacillin, cerbenicillin, and ticarcillin. There's a few more diseases that can also be treated with fungal-produced compounds, and these include diseases like malaria and diabetes. 
Malaria is a particularly deadly infection, and it's caused by an amoeboid pathogen. It can be treated with fungal-produced compounds like zervomycins. Diabetes is a failure in the regulation of blood sugar, and it can be treated with fungal compounds like ternatin and aspergillosol A. Besides these, many fungi can and have been used by humans as agents for psychological and spiritual health. Some fungal species have psychotropic properties, producing chemicals that alter neurochemistry in weird ways. To the person ingesting the psychotropic fungi, the effects can be indescribably bizarre. The most well-known of these psychotropic fungi are the psilocybin mushrooms, or psychedelic mushrooms, also known as magic mushrooms. These contain the psychedelic compounds psilocin and psilocybin, which are human-safe entheogenic compounds that really put the magic in magic mushrooms. Earlier in the episode, I mentioned conocybe mushrooms with psychotropic effects. These all work with psilocybin and psilocin, and they include species like C. tenera, C. cuneriana, and C. saliginioides. Like other conocybe mushrooms, these are all relatively small, with white or cream-colored stems and brown caps. Historically, these have been consumed for their psychotropic properties, like the C. cuneriana, which is harvested and consumed in Mexico. Psilocybin has a low toxicity, which means that it's relatively safe. Based on studies that found an LD50 in rats, or the dosage that's lethal to 50% of the population, humans would need to eat close to 4 pounds of mushrooms to ingest enough psilocybin to give them a 50% chance of dying. 4 pounds of mushrooms is huge. That's like two giant bags of mushrooms. This is an amount that you would never eat accidentally. You wouldn't even get close to it. So for all practical purposes, psilocybin is totally chemically safe for the human body and the human brain. Once ingested, psilocybin is metabolized largely in the liver, where it has a phosphate group removed, and this turns it into psilocin. The psilocin binds to serotonin receptors, especially the 5-HT, 2B, and 2C receptors in the brain. In the cerebral cortex, which is the larger outer layer of the brain that helps regulate, uh, among other things, emotional state, psilocin binds to the serotonin receptors, and that makes you feel good feelings like happiness, calmness, uh, and empathy. It also increases the amount of dopamine produced in the basal ganglia, which then passes through various neurochemical pathways, like the mesolimbic pathway, to other parts of the brain. This produces a sense of reward and satisfaction, and also stimulates motivation and working memory. The archaeological evidence shows that human societies have been consuming psilocybin mushrooms for literally thousands of years, all over the world. They've been used widely in shamanic traditions, in ceremonies, and as part of an individual's spiritual development, in cultures from the inland expanses of Scandinavia to the Indian subcontinent to the Australasian archipelago, and from the boreal stretches of North America down to the forests and jungles and mountainous highlands of South America. Their use was particularly popular in Mesoamerica, with many indigenous populations celebrating the hallucinogenic mushrooms as divine and sacred. The Aztecs called the local psilocybe mushroom that they used for this purpose the Tionanacatl, or the divine mushroom. The Mesoamerican peoples used these mushrooms ritualistically, for their spiritual and religious significance, until the Spanish came and invaded. The Christian Spaniards perceived the mushroom consumption and its associated rituals to be a form of idolatry and a violation against Christ, and so they suppressed it. They weren't entirely successful, as remote communities were able to maintain their traditions, but a lot of blood was shed over this. The almost universal high praise for these fungi comes from their numerous beneficial effects, which, depending on the dosage, can be profound and life-altering. They also have no physical negatives. They don't cause dependence. They aren't habit-forming. And even though it's technically a poison, no one has ever died from psilocybin, as far as I know. The worst negative that comes from them is when you have what's called a bad trip. But that has more to do with your set and your setting than with the the chemical itself. 
If you've never consumed psilocybin mushrooms, but you're interested in trying them, and you're interested in experiencing the mycelial wisdom that so many other humans have experienced going back for thousands of years, then pay attention, because I'm going to tell you what to do. Typically, if you're looking to consume some mushrooms and have a psychedelic experience, you might want to start with a small dose, unless you're feeling kind of brave, but I would recommend starting with a small dose. Less than one gram of dried mushroom is a small dose, and that'll have minor effects. Uh, if you have a large body size, or if you're just naturally kind of resilient to it, you might not feel anything at all with a dose this small. Regular doses are between 1 and 2.5 dried grams of the mushroom, like the cap and the stem. And stronger doses are up to 5 grams. Anything more than 5 grams is popularly described as heroic, thanks to psychedelic popularizers like Terence McKenna. If you get a chance, you should really check out Terence McKenna. That guy was a very fascinating person, and he had a lot of really interesting, really thought-provoking things to say about human existence, human societies, psychedelics, spirituality, God, the afterlife, everything that's controversial and interesting. He had a really unique, awesome take on it. And so you should, if you're interested in this at all, you really should research Terence McKenna. He is your best resource for the psychedelic experience. Anyways, after you've consumed your mushrooms, whatever dose you've chosen, you'll have to wait a bit for them to kick in. They don't kick in instantly. And so it can take about 45 minutes to two hours for them to fully start working. Now, during this period, you might feel uncomfortably excited or anxious, like you, you don't know what to do with yourself. You don't want to sit down and stay still, but you don't know what to do. You should try to remain calm, as this anxiety is just, it's temporary, it's superficial, it'll go away shortly. When it actually begins to affect you, the experience that you have, it's very subjective. It'll be different from person to person, and it'll be different for you from trip to trip, as it, it really depends on your set and your setting and your previous experience with psychedelics. Now this part about set and setting is really important. Your set refers to your mindset. It's your psychological state going into the psychedelic experience. You want to be in a good mood with nothing pressing on your mind. You don't want any other work that you should be doing. You don't want any approaching deadlines. You don't want anything that'll make you worry excessively or get anxious. Now, the setting refers to your literal, physical setting. Where you are, who you're with, what you're doing. You want your setting to be somewhere calm and peaceful, where you can have privacy and you can feel safe. If you have people with you, you generally want them to be friends or people you like or people you enjoy tripping with. If you're new to it, it's nice to have a sitter, which is a sober person who will hang out with you guys. And it's also nice to have someone to consume mushrooms with, someone who will have a psychedelic experience with you. In traditional shamanic rituals, the shaman, who is extremely well-versed in the psychedelic mind state, he'll ingest the substance with you, and he'll be your sitter. He'll guide you through the experience and help you learn from it and understand what you're feeling and what you're experiencing. The total experience, or the trip, will last about four to eight hours, depending on the dosage. Although this might sound like a long time, the strongest effects occur in the first couple hours, and after the peak, the effects will wear off slowly, and they get pretty easy to ignore. Now at the beginning of the trip, when the effects begin to set in and you start to feel them, you might notice that colors are brighter and more vivid, and that lighting is more rich and vibrant. You might notice visual hallucinations when you look at patterned surfaces, like carpet or stucco walls. These surfaces and these patterns can seem to liquefy and melt together, or they might seem to breathe or warp and twist. If stuff is moving around you, especially lights, you'll see trails following the objects. If you listen to music, you might be struck by a profound emotional impact and the quality of the musical piece may seem to be the best thing or the coolest thing that you've ever heard. Besides these visual stimuli, the psychedelic trip is also extremely introspective. If you allow it, if you follow your trail of thoughts, you can stumble upon insights about yourself that are profound and life-altering. You might find confidence or courage or conviction where you need it. You might find compassion and empathy and sensitivity for your fellow creatures. 
you can very deeply realize a connection between yourself and the rest of the living world in experiences that are described as deeply humbling and spiritual. Many people who have had a strong experience with psilocybin will describe it years later as the most spiritual moment of their lives. Of course, all of this comes with having a certain respect for the psilocybin mushroom, and using its intoxication constructively. Plenty of people consume them just for fun, with no intention of meditation or introspective thinking at all. And that's fine too, as long as they're being responsible and not endangering themselves or other people. Now, you might have heard me use the word entheogen, or calling these uh, compounds entheogenic. An entheogen is a compound that, upon consumption, will deliver to you uh, visions and feelings that seem divine in nature. The aesthetic value and beauty of the world around you might become magnified, and this can be emotionally very overwhelming sometimes. Uh, at higher doses, you can experience what's called ego death. And this may sound scary, but it's actually a, a much sought-after state of mind. Ego death is when your ego, your perception of who you are in this world around you that's kind of an illusion based on all of your social constructs and whatnot that you live in, that ego gets dissolved. And you begin to see past your skin as a barrier to your body, as a barrier to the limits of who you are as an individual. You begin to feel integrated chemically and aesthetically on a much larger scale with everything around you. There's a sense of unification, a sense of oneness with the world around you. You feel your place in the world in a very profound sense. Being able to reach this state and maintain this state of extremely empathetic, sensitive awareness of the world around you, that's called nirvana or enlightenment. And it's, it's a state of mind that's much sought after in various Buddhist and Hindu schools of thought. Psychedelic mushrooms, if you've never tried them before, they really will help you understand your place on this world, on this earth, as a human being, as a biological construct in this larger chemical ecology. I mean, I know a lot of this sounds kind of obtuse and flowery and kind of woo-woo, but seriously, these entheogenic compounds are no joke. If you take a small dose and you don't feel anything, or you don't have this kind of introspective entheogenic experience, take more. There's, there's no reason to say, oh, this doesn't work, oh, it's not legit. If you are trying to have this kind of spiritually cathartic, spiritually uh, developing experience, take a heroic dose of psilocybin mushrooms. Experience what's beyond the veil. It opens you up to the possibility that the world is much stranger and much grander and much more beautiful than you might have thought initially. In the modern day, there's a lot of legal problems surrounding the psilocybin mushroom. Despite the relative safety and the amazing spiritual and psychological and emotional effects of uh, consuming psilocybin mushrooms, they're described as a Schedule I drug by the UN 1971 Convention on Psychotropic Substances. And in the US and other Western countries like the UK and Canada, possession of psilocybin and psilocybin mushrooms carries extremely heavy legal and financial punishments. I will be the first person to say that these prohibitions on psilocybin are not just anti-scientific and moronic, they're outrageous and offensive to any sense of human freedom and dignity. The silver lining is that there is progress being made. It's not just a hopeless abyss of doom and gloom. Thanks to wonderful organizations like MAPS, or the Multidisciplinary Association for the Psychedelic Studies, Psilocybin-containing mushrooms are undergoing phase 1 and phase 2 studies for efficacy in human patients, specifically for their use in treating PTSD in combat veterans. They also study psilocybin's use in treating end-of-life anxiety and the fear of death in patients that have terminal illnesses. And all of their studies have shown really remarkable, beneficial, positive results. Even the FDA is interested. Rick Doblin, who's the founder of MAPS, has reported that the FDA is shocked at how effective psilocybin is, considering its dosage and its almost complete lack of negative side effects. The FDA thinks that psilocybin's safety profile is amazing, especially compared to its effectiveness. Like, it's, it's a wonder drug. It's, it really is incredible. 
all fungus are incredible, not just the psilocybin mushrooms. All fungus are incredible. They all perform an incredible role in the world's ecology. They all have an incredible role to play in the evolutionary history of life on this planet. But I've talked about fungus for long enough. This is the end of a long episode, and it's the end of a long but amazingly fascinating series on the kingdom fungi. As I've explored this mycelial world with you, I hope you were able to learn stuff and get inspired about how crazy and wild and exotically alien the fungi really are. These are amazing organisms, often unseen or overlooked, but they're absolutely integral to our biosphere. Just as fungi are a big part of human societies, fungi are a really big part of planet Earth. Fundamentally, fungi are the world's biological recyclers, taking biomass locked up in the rotting corpses of dead animals and decaying plants and dissolving them on a chemical level so as to return the nutrients into the ecosystem to support the birth and the growth of new life. And as always, thanks for listening. Would you like to support the Biologic Podcast? It's super easy. When you open a new episode, press the like button or share it with your friends. If you aren't subscribed, you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week. You can also peruse our official store, which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. All the links you need are in the description section below.